Cool. Good evening. My name is Kelly Kina, and I have the honor of working with this amazing organization uh, as a board president and also as faculty. And um, I'm going to get us started this evening because our amazing Krista Dillaba is out. So I'm filling in her very big shoes tonight. Um, so, so glad you're all here. And, um, you know, for those of you who are new to us, we are the Morpho Institute. Um, our mission is to support the key role of education in realizing the global goals of uh, Amazon conservation and sustainability. And we do this in three key ways. We provide US teachers with transformative professional development. Um, some of those, uh, the benefactors of that transformational professional development here with us tonight. Um, we create and share effective teaching resources and we support on the ground uh, conservation initiatives in Peru. So if you are um, new to us, I'll drop the link to our website in the chat for y'all to check us out. Now, um, as I said, we have folks tonight who've been to the Amazon with us, who get to go to the Amazon with us this summer after waiting some of you more than two years. Um, and uh, again, those of you who are new to us, just another big warm welcome. And um, I also would speculate that everybody here tonight has some interest in uh, birds and you are in the right place, which is amazing. Um, Tonight we get to hear from my dear friend and um, my boat birding buddy, Dr. Nancy Troutman, about a pretty incredible app that has changed a lot for me personally. Um, this app is called Merlin from the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And just a few housekeeping things. We are going to be sending you a link to all the things that Nancy is going to be talking about at the end of this presentation. So if you're like me, I'm trying to furiously write down what's happening. Um, let me ease your, your uh, writing hand a little bit and let you know that we'll be sending all of those to you at the end of this presentation because we're hoping that you can uh, spend this evening's conversation really thinking about what this is and also how to apply it in your local context. And at the end of uh, Nancy's presentation, we'll have a jam board where everybody can put their ideas there and we can have um, a good discussion about that. As always, questions can go right in the chat. I'll be monitoring those as Nancy's talking. Um, and so if you have questions that arise for, for Nancy, please feel free to drop them in there. And yeah, so Nancy's gonna tell you a little bit more about herself and her work uh, at the lab as the education director. But I will tell you that Nancy is a kind, deeply passionate, intelligent, fierce friend who has a really wonderful sense of humor and loves potu birds, which is like why I have my potu <laughs> puppet here with me this evening in her honor. So, <laughs> um, so I'm really excited for us to be able to spend the next hour with her and I will turn it over to you, Nancy. Take it away. Well, thank you, Kelly, for that wonderful introduction, um, especially with the POTU. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes? Yes, we hear you. Okay, yes. great. Perfect. Okay, so I was at the Lab of Ornithology from 2008 and through 2019, and I have to say I really loved being immersed in this place with people who are passionate about birds and, mm. and also cared deeply about helping other people learn about birds. And one of the ways that one of the fringe benefits was to go on amazing expeditions like this one to Peru, to the Amazon, where um, those of you who've been there will recognize this is the canopy walkway looking out over the Amazon. What better place to go birding, but how better to do it than with an expert guide right there um, helping you to see birds, but also helping you to figure out what you're listening to or seeing. And also on the home front, whether it was around the lab of ornithology or in my backyard, I was wishing I could have a guide like that with me all the time. And there were a lot of discussions back when I started at the lab in 2008 about how to make that sort of guide on the side or a pocket coach. This was when smartphones were first coming out and we had really 
at those times, wild dreams about how could we put the lab of ornithology on a phone so that you could have it with you wherever you went. And I'm happy to say that that's really taken shape over the years. Um, and it's been really fascinating for me to watch that happen and see some of it from behind the scenes and then also to get out and, and use these new tools in the field and see how useful they are for teachers and for education. So what, the, what it's culminated in is a lab, a, an app called Merlin. Merlin is a kind of bird, a, a small raptor, but it's also the name of a magician. And so with that two meanings, it's like Merlin app is meant to be a magical way of helping people to learn more about the birds um, that they see and hear. So I wanna start out by saying, none of this would be possible without eBird. Um, uh, this uh, eBird is probably, it's one of the world's largest citizen science projects. Anybody anywhere in the world can submit checklists of the, of the birds that they've seen. And those get vetted through various ways to make sure that the data are, are actually um, valid scientifically. And so this has built up a huge database. It's now over a billion bird observations. And this map that we're looking at hasn't been drawn by any, anything other than bird observation submittals. So there's no country boundaries, roads or anything drawn on that map. It's all just where people have submitted eBird information. Where you see it meandering off through the ocean, those are ships where people have been submitting um, bird observations. So the eBird database is hugely, um, it's, it's what made it possible to create Merlin. It's also made it possible for re researchers all over the world to do, to conduct scientific research, conservation projects, modeling, all that sort of thing. So here's what Merlin looks like today. And let's just start, it was launched in 2014 for the most common birds in the United States and Canada. In 2016, they added the first international species. So let's take a look at the first feature here, start bird ID. If you press that on your phone, it prompts you through five questions. The first is where did you see the bird and when? So if you have your smartphone in the field, you can just, the phone knows where you are and when, so you can just say yes and yes, and then go on to the next screen. If you're doing this after the fact, you can enter that information manually. The third question is what size was the bird? And I, so I'm just doing a hypothetical bird that I saw the other day. It was between the size of a sparrow and a robin. So I fill in this circle here. Go on to the next. Um, what were the main colors? Well, my bird was pretty drab. I'm just going to say black and gray and white. And then go on to the next. And then these are, where was it? What was it doing? Was it on the ground? Was it at a feeder? My bird was in the trees or bushes. So that's all the information I need to provide. And then Merlin has this wheel that goes around saying, creating list of possible birds. So what it's doing there is it's cranking through all the eBird data of what birds could be at that time and place that fit those descriptors of size and color and habitat. And then what it's coming up with is not a definitive um, ID, but a list of possible birds. And why is it not definitive? Well, one reason is because I might not have described it properly, and no two people are going to describe the same bird exactly the same. Um, and then, so what um, it does is it comes up with a list of options that that it thinks fit those descriptors pretty well. In my case, it was not this first choice, the white breast did not hatch, but the second one, the dark eyed junco. So I could scroll down, I can click on the junco and I say, yeah, yeah, that is what it looked like. I can flip through more pictures of the junco. I can read about its habitat here, see if that fits. Um, down at the bottom, I can play its sounds and I can click on the map icon and it shows me where it is at different times of year. So here in New York State, I can see that it's here year round. Oh, that makes sense. It's a bird I'm familiar with seeing in my yard all year. So I could confirm it and say, this is my bird. And if I do that, that helps the people who um, are creating and updating the Merlin app to see that that, that, was, that it was helpful in 
um, identifying that bird for me with those descriptors. If I didn't see the bird that I thought I'd seen, I can always go back. I can change the colors or the size and try again. All right, so let's go on to the next feature, photo ID. This came out in 2016. The idea here is to um, take a picture and have Merlin identify what bird that picture of is of. And so it could be a picture that you take in the field right now, or it could be one that you've taken long ago, perhaps on a vacation. As long as you know when and where it was, you can enter that um, and have Merlin help you identify it. So I took a walk from my home and I, I saw this bird way off in a tree. Do you see it? It's way up here. And I thought, okay, this is be a good test for Merlin because I don't have a great camera. I'm not a good photographer, but there is a bird up there. So what I did was I loaded this picture into Merlin and then it asks you to crop around the bird and make it as big as possible within the frame. And then it spins its wheels and it asks you to confirm the location and date. So here, if it's one I took on vacation three weeks ago, I could put that in here and then it identifies my bird. So there's a bald eagle. Um, this is not a hard bird to identify, but I do think that it's pretty awesome that it was able to do it from so far away uh, um, just with a cell phone picture, not um, one of those amazing professional pictures that, that so many other photographers are able to get. So how did Berlin learn to do this? It was actually a several year project um, that used lots of volunteers who went on the Lab of Ornithology's website and just for fun, they were they took pictures of birds that were shown to them and they cropped them to fit into a square. And what that did was that provided millions of pictures that um, computer engineers could use to look for patterns, to train the computer to identify different species. This is called machine learning and computer vision. And the lab actually teamed up with scientists out in California who were interested in training computers to do that sort of work, not necessarily for bird ID, but they were really thrilled that we had so many bird pictures. And so it was a really good fit to work together. So next step, here I am out in the woods behind my house and I'm not seeing birds, but I am hearing them. And through my years at the lab, one of the big wishes was to have what we were calling a Shazam for birds, where you could go out and take your phone and listen to a bird and have it tell you what you were listening to. I remember times when I would record something on my phone and take it to work and get one of my friends at the lab to tell me what was that mystery bird that I was he hearing singing in the woods. So it was a dream, and we thought that it was a pretty far off dream because there are a lot of challenges to identifying bird song. Um, one, of the, one of the challenges is that birds don't always sing the same song. They have different dialects in different areas. Um, it's, it's just not simple. But the breakthrough came when the researchers began treating these sounds as images, sort of like the photo ID, making turning the sounds into images and then applying those same sorts of classification algorithms so that they could um, do, Put, sort them into different categories um, for what species they might be. So here I am in my woods. I pull out Merlin. This time I'm interested in sound ID. So I press that button, sound ID comes up, and then I press the microphone. And I stand there and it says it's listening for birds. Initially it's not hearing any, but what you'll see is up here, there's some gray lines there. And what it's doing is it's actually recording other sounds that are not birds. In my case, it was the wind whistling through the forest there. So one of the things that they had to do in developing this sound ID feature was to train the computer to recognize what is not bird sound. So it could be traffic, it could be an airplane, it could be leaves rustling, it could even be other animals squirrels making noises or whatever. So those were things that 
the um, engineers had to train Merlin to uh, to not register as birds. Okay, so we're um, listening and it's making this sort of pattern up here. What is that pattern? It's actually a spectrogram, which is a way of making a sound into a picture. What I'm showing here is a um, thing created by the Lab of Ornithology called Bird Song Hero, which is a game. Um, and as part of the training for playing that game, it teaches you what is a spectrogram. It's basically like reading music with low pitch and high pitch along the y-axis and time along the x-axis. And then loudness, the brighter the colors are here, the, light, the louder the sound is. So if you play Bird Song Hero, you press this button here, you play a song, and then you, you get to select, is it um, a wren or a common yellow throat or a cardinal? And you can play each of those sounds. And it's a great way to train your ear um, for looking at sound and hearing it and ma making those matches. And then also a great way just to learn some of the common bird songs. So that's what a spectrogram is. And going back to the woods, you can see that now Merlin has started hearing some birds for me. It picked up a tufted titmouse, black-capped chickadee, and then a brown-headed cowbird. And with each one of these, if the chickadee sings again, this line will light up yellow. And so it, it trains, you know, if you stand there and watch it, it actually is telling you what you're hearing and, and you can see it happening on the spectrogram scrolling by up above. I was particularly interested here in the brown-headed cowbird. You can see this orange dot here indicates that it's a species that isn't um, common here at this time of year. And I have to say, when I was standing there doing the recording, I didn't hear the cowbird. So I wanted to look into that a little bit more. So I saved my recording and I can come back to it anytime. It's until I erase it, it's still there. It comes up, it shows me my list of birds and then there are these little um, triangles here. If I click on the one for brown-headed cowbird, it shows me a, a list of songs and calls for that species and I can play them. I can listen to them and see the spectrogram. And so what I noticed there was that the brown-headed cowbird makes this little squiggle. And then I went back and looked at my own recording and sure enough, there's the cowbird squiggle. So I, by doing this, have taught myself how to listen for a cowbird and how to look for it in a spectrogram. So I um, just wanted to point out that this sound ID feature is really useful for, for just going out. If you hear one bird and you don't know what it is, you can play that and it'll tell you. But it also is really good for teasing apart a lot of different birds that are singing at once like in a dawn chorus, for example, they can be overlapping, there can be traffic noise in the background. And Merlin does a, a remarkably good job of teasing all those pieces apart. So how does this work? This is a screenshot from uh, a webinar that was done by the Lab of Ornithology for the public. And this um, man on the right here is Dr. Um, Grant Van Horn. He was a, a doctoral student out at Caltech when we start, when the labs first started working on the photo ID, and he um, collaborated with the lab on doing that and came up with those algorithms that allows Merlin to identify photos. And he did similar work for iNaturalist, so it's used in the iNaturalist program and their Seek app as well. So his specialty was um, machine learning and visual classification of photographs. But then he um, later went on to use those that same sort of um, modeling to categorize bird songs. And I love the way he just sort of waves his hands here and says there's a machine learning model that looks like this little bird-shaped robot. But when you go behind the scenes and have him talk about it a bit more, it's actually quite a complicated model. And one of the things that they had to do in order to make the sound ID feature work was to have thousands of hours of people manually going in and taking the spectrograms and drawing boxes around different species and labeling them. So these were 
um, expert birders and scientists who did that, um, did that annotation and then fed that into the machine learning model that learned um, how to identify each of these species. And this is an ongoing effort, even now that the Sound ID app has been, or featured on the app has been released. They keep um, doing more and more of this in order to make it more accurate. So one of the things that Grant um, talked about in the seminar is what are they looking for when they continue doing those annotations? One thing they're looking for is false, like, um, false negatives, which are missed opportunities to identify a particular bird that's singing. Um, so maybe the person annotating it found that there was a cardinal singing, but Merlin didn't identify it. So that would be a false negative. The other is obviously a false positive where Merlin is identifying something incorrectly. Um, that makes Merlin look bad. <clears throat> look bad. So there's a um, continuing effort to improve, um, reduce both the false negatives and the, the false positives. What Grant said was that um, it's these these numbers obviously are different for each species, but on average, Merlin right now, um, the average recall is 0.59. So 59% of the time it's recalling um, that species when it's singing, even at some faint level in a mixed soundscape. Um, average precision is actually 95%. So if Berlin is saying that that was a northern cardinal, it's a very high likelihood that that is in fact what it is. But those are, those are numbers that they keep working on improving. So for each species, they keep trying to get up to that star up in the corner where it's accu accurate su suggestions for all bird songs. And um, some species are much harder to do this for than others. Some have um, a lot of different dialects in different parts of the country, and some are mimics. You know, there's some birds that intentionally sound like other species. So that makes it, um, those species are much harder to accurately, um, accurately measure in, in Merlin. So one of, I, one of the, the thing that made it possible to create this app, the, the sound ID feature in the app is that this growing number of audio assets, which are recordings that have been submitted to the Lab of Ornithology through eBird. 2015 was the first year when eBird started accepting photos and sound files as part of those bird checklists. And you can see that each year we've gotten more and more of those, and that's making it possible um, to add more and more species to the Sound ID app. Right now, um, it, it was released just last summer in 2021 with, um, I think it was 458 species. And the goal this spring is to bring that up to 685 species. It'll still be limited to um, the United States and Canada and some of Europe. It won't be accurately um, working down in Latin America, for example, um, in the next few months. But what we have to do is keep getting more and more recordings down there and that will make it more feasible um, to develop that feature of Merlin um, for those places. So for each new species that's added, Merlin, um, or the scientists work first with a training data set to train the model. And then they set those data aside and run the model using a quiz set of data. And then once that's working up to their specifications, then they release that species to Merlin with that ongoing process of annotating and improving it over time. So I want to jump now to um, this idea of teaching physics through birdsong. So one of the things I found is that teachers really love the idea of um, spectrograms and how you can link the physics to the biology by looking at spectrograms. And I found this set of teaching resources that was developed by a, a professor in Britain. Um, and he has two sets, one for British birds and one for um, American birds. It's a free download. And it's sort of like the Birdsong Hero game. The game you could assign to students to do on their own. What he has is a PowerPoint that you can download and you can 
play the sounds right in there, the sound of the cardinal, and then have your students figure out, is this the right spectrogram or is this one? And he does that for a number of species and then has some teaching notes to go with it. So I think that's a, a nice resource to, to know about. And then finally, I wanna jump to this final feature of the Merlin app, which is explore birds. Who doesn't want to explore birds? So when you download Merlin, you download a bird pack to go with it. And the reason for that is because if you did all the birds of the world, it would fill up your entire phone and more so. So what they did is they made a number of different bird packs so that you can pick just the ones that are um, useful in your area. So one of the things I love to do is to use this to the explore birds feature to figure out what birds am I likely to see today right here in my area? Um, so here's the list for me. And if you've downloaded this and you're not seeing likely birds or you're not, you're not seeing it ordered in terms of likely birds or you're not seeing it in the right location, you wanna go up here to this corner because that's where the menu is, excuse me, for changing those specifications. So for each one of these birds, what I can do you can click on it, you can see photos of it, um, all the same things we saw before, the sounds and the maps. But the, another thing you can do is look at these bar charts. So these black things or gray things going across are bar, uh, bar charts. And what they show is the likelihood of seeing that bird if you went out at that time of year. So this is a year going across and right now we're in March. So you can see for all of these species, they're pretty evenly distributed throughout the year in Ithaca. But if I scroll down, I get to some that are only here part of the year. So for example, you can see the cedar waxwing. It's here all year, but if you, right here in March, there are a few of them, but we would be more likely to see them in the summer months, which is the opposite of the common red pole which is here this time of year, but what happens in the summer? They're not here at all. Why is that? Well, we can click on those species right here in Merlin and what comes up are um, the species pictures and then you can click at the bottom down here and see the maps. So you can see for Cedar Waxwing where I live in New York, they're here year round as we would predict from these bar charts. Um, but a bit more common in the summer because some of the birds that were down here have moved back up um, to my state to, for the breeding season. But what about the common red pole? Where I live in New York, they're only here during their non-breeding season. So that's the winter months. And then they migrate up north for breeding. So I love the fact that you can just scan through this list of birds in your area and see which ones are likely to be migrating and, and not and which ones are migrating and not and which ones you're likely to see at different times of year. So I also wanted to um, tell you about, we talked a little bit about bird packs. Right now I've got the birds um, for, for Ithaca. So it's Northeast United States. You, they have different regions of the United States. There also are bird packs up on this, this menu on the left top left corner leads you to bird packs. And there are bird packs for all over the world now, quite a variety of them, including the Amazon, the Peruvian Amazon. So I downloaded that one um, because one of the things that Merlin is really good for is helping you to figure out what birds are going to be somewhere where you're planning to go. It might be if you're taking a trip to the beach or you're going to see a relative in another state, you might want to download the bird pack for that place and then figure out what birds are more, most likely to be there when you go there so that you're ready um, to find them. So I'm gonna download the, the birds of Peru. And then when I go up to, um, to that upper right-hand corner and tell it where I wanna look for, I can actually um, type in a location or I can use a map. And what I've done here is I've zoomed right in on where we go on the Napo River off of the Amazon River, because I want to know what birds are right there. 
and it brings up the likely birds today. So what a great way to get started about learning about the birds wherever you're going to go, um, whether it's the Amazon or to visit your cousin in Florida or whatever. And for each one of these birds, again, you can click on it and you can pull up pictures of it. You can pull up sounds. Wouldn't you love to go to Peru and know that that's a spangled cotingo when you see it in the sparkling there on a tree branch? Or <laughs> Kelly at the beginning talked about that common potu is one of my favorite birds. It actually looks like a tree stump, right? But when you're sleeping, you often can hear in the night something that sounds like somebody playing a flute in the forest. That's the song of the common potu. So if you're heading to Peru, you might in advance want to go to this part and check out the sounds, play that, and then when you hear it, it might say, oh, that was a potu. So I just want to say that if you don't, if you're working with students and don't have smartphones for people, the Merlin app also works on the web. So if you go to the All About Birds website by the Lab of Ornithology and you click on bird ID, it brings up something that looks very much like the smartphone version and you can use it right there. It's not as portable or as much fun as going out in the field with it, but it is useful for identifying photos of birds or um, doing some of the other kinds of activities that we've talked about here. So with that, I know I've rushed through a lot of things quickly, so I wanna open it up for questions. And then um, we also want to have you have a chance to put in your ideas on the Jamboard. So what I'd like to do right now is, is both of those things. If you have questions, please enter them in the chat. And um, Kelly's gonna put the link to the Jamboard in the chat. What we'd like you to do there is, is address these questions about how are you using Merlin in your teaching? How can you envision using it? And, and or what further help would be useful? And then we do wanna come back and discuss all this. Um, and then I just want to say we, we will summarize what's in the Jamboard and in the questions, and that'll become part of the notes that we send out afterwards. So um, don't worry about copying things down if you see other um, good ideas by other people. So Kelly, can I turn it over to you to figure out the Jamboard? Yes, so the Jamboard link is in the chat. And I see people in there and entering some ideas. Um, in the meantime, Nancy, a question, do you still carry, carry a field guide with you when you go out? <laughs> <laughs> That's a great question. <laughs> and the answer is yes. Although I have to say the Birds of Peru guide weighs about 25 pounds and um, <laughs> I'm less inclined to carry it now, but I do love flipping through the pages in a bird guide as well. So yes, um, but I, I, I think Merlin is, is a wonderful way to get started because if you have no idea what you're looking at, you can flip through a lot of pages in a bird guide without really knowing where to go. Um, so I, I like you using a combination. And I also still love going with expert guides who can just tell me what I'm looking at. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. Okay, so yeah, and, that, and then Kathy said, we use field guides when we come back unless we're in a boat. Um, yeah, exactly. Um, one of the, the pieces I'll talk about, you know, um, we hear when we go with Dr. Dave Pearson, um, he talks about, don't be a visual bigot. If you hear a bird, it counts. <laughs> and um, this audio recording feature, this bird song ID, sound ID um, is, is really helpful to just train our ears. Um, so I, I love that, that um, feature of the app. Now it's really very cool. And I have been using that when I go birding in the morning on my paddleboard. I set it up and I hit um, sound ID and I hit record. And it's very cool how as I'm paddling along in the dawn chorus and watching the, the different birds that it's identified light up on my phone as I'm paddling. So it's really has, it's done a really great job at training my ear to the, a lot of birds that I didn't even know were up in the cottonwood trees as I was paddling. 
and then they keep lighting up as, yeah. as the same species. So it, it you can guess you you can keep the recording going and see them again and again. So so exciting. Um, it's just such a cool addition. Um, Nancy, do the the do our recordings similar to how eBird works and and people are looking at our observations and um, and that's adding to that collective you know brain power of eBird. Do our recordings also help Merlin um, with accuracy or do those feed into it at all? They don't. Um, the, the recordings that they're using for annotations are ones that are more, um, they're not the ones that we're entering through our own devices. If, if people enter um, complete checklists in eBird and, and include sound files there, those do go into Macaulay Library and do get used for this kind of work. Awesome. The, Merlin is more of a teaching tool, so, and we're not entering full. So one thing that makes eBird more of a scientific tool is you have to enter a full, you have to say, this is a checklist of all the birds that I've seen or heard in this location. Um, that makes it a more full um, data set for what's there. And so it's more usable for, 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 the real scientific purposes, whereas Merlin is more of a teaching tool and it's helping you to identify perhaps even just one bird at a time and you can enter your photos. What It'll build a life list for you, but it doesn't go into the, um, the scientific collection that eBird is collecting, it, unless you submit those data through eBird, which you, you certainly can do after you've collected them in Merlin. Okay. Okay, great. Um, there is a question that came up in the Jamboard that I'll, I'll share with you, Nancy, as we um, as people keep entering their thoughts. Is, um, one says, it was neat to hear about the component about machine learning. In your opinion, would this topic be considered beyond the scope of a high school science or technology class? That's a really good question. And I would love to hear um, Grant Van Horn um, talk about that. I mean, he did it for his PhD work. And when you look behind the scenes, there's like lots of computer coding that goes into that. Um, so I think it would be beyond the scope of a science student at the high school level to write that code, but they might be intrigued to learn how it works. Um, so there is there is a public um, webinar that I'll share with you where, where he talks a little bit about that. He doesn't go into the, how the coding is done. If there are serious questions about that, I'm happy to bring them up with him. He's very friendly and, and wants to help people learn about Merlin and how to use it. And so let me know if, if that would be of interest. Great. Yeah, so I don't, I can't tell who, we're, we all have anonymous um, animal names in the damn board, but <laughs> feel free to um, put that in the, the chat in the back in the Zoom. I know we're asking people to go between platforms here. Um, Nancy, another question that came up was, um, I was told Merlin takes up a lot of data space on a phone. I'd, I'd love to know if that is always the case. Um, so, so that's why they've created different bird packs. So the, it takes up a lot of data if you um, put in more than one bird pack. They've tried to keep each bird pack small enough to not um, be a, a to not hog too much space on your phone. If you're like me and your phone is totally filled with photos, you might run out of space and have to do some juggling around before you can <laughs> download the bird packs that you want. <laughs> Yes, and I will say too that from from my, all of my audio recordings that I've been doing, I do have to go in and um, and cut down, delete some of those files every once in a while. Um, but you know, I find that I have sometimes I have multiple files of similar birds, and so um, and I also learned that I don't always go back and look at them after I know what the bird is. And so they're they're definitely. It takes some attention, but the audio files seem to take up a little bit of space. So your own audio files, if you want to keep those, you can export those to your computer instead of keeping them in Merlin. Oh, oh. Um, that's perfect. Yeah, so that, 
that is possible. Kelly is Kelly Richardson is noting that she's downloading the Peru um, pack and it's a 1.12 gigabyte pack. Is that all of Peru? Because there also are ones for different regions within Peru. And it's been a while since I did it. So just um, the, okay, just the Amazon one. Okay. So it does take, I mean, the thing that makes it take the size that it is, is that it includes those songs and photos and you know, they can only compress those so much. So, yeah. And, yeah, and when we, you, we, oh, sorry, Nancy, go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say to me, it's a miracle that they take that big, heavy, fat um, Birds of Peru book and make it into something that even partially fits on my phone. Yeah, and I found that that just knowing what the bird calls are, having that audio piece in there under the bird identification was really, powerful um you know again just knowing being able to see what the images are multiple images and having the the audio and the map in there is is really powerful and i i don't carry my bird book my field guide with me anymore now that i've gotten a little bit more savvy with merlin um so i've i've relied on it pretty heavily but i still when i go somewhere new um i still find that i just like having the bird book um, because I'm still kind of figuring out being in a new space and having the field guide and having having the app. But even the last trip I was on, I, I had the field guide, the, the book, and I still just used the app. So um, it, it's, it's really fun to see how we can get used to using it. Um, Nancy, do you so, want me to read some of these uh, ideas from the Jamboard right now? Um, yes, but just a second. Jessica Feld okay. asked, can you delete a bird pack if you're not using it? And the answer is yes. So you, you can download them for when you go on a trip and then remove them when you get home. So okay. yes, I'm not actually looking at the Jamboard. So Kelly, do you want to? Um, yeah, actually, there's a few more questions in here too. I can share it or I can just read them to you, Nancy. What would you what would you prefer? or I mean the other thing is I would welcome people turning on their microphones and just talking if you have ideas if you have questions or um, are you already using Merlin in your classes do you want to tell people about it this is really um, meant to be a discussion time great okay does anybody want to jump in you can unmute we can um turn cameras on, I think our Wi-Fi will take it. There's a lot of really great ideas in here. While everybody's thinking about jumping in, one of the questions was, um, and I think you talked about this, but I'll bring it up again. Do you have to have Wi-Fi to get the app to work? That's a wonderful question. So the answer is no. Um, what you want to do, though, is before you go out in the field without Wi-Fi, download the app and then download the bird pack of where you're going to be and, and then get as precise as you want to be about the location and get it all set up. And then that's in its memory. And then you can go out in the field without Wi-Fi and it'll work just fine. Awesome. Um, okay, so there's there's some in here about using us with pre-service teachers, some about fourth graders. Um, we talked about, you know, the machine learning component for high school students, um, outdoor investigations with students. Um, and let's see, further students' ability to visualize a song. I love that. Um, project that records biodiversity of the woods around the school. So really great ideas in here if anybody wants to jump on and think about how they either are or could apply this um, after what you know now. So we'll, this is we'll Cinda. Hi, Cinda. So um, for me, we've been using iNaturalist a lot in the outdoor explorations. And um, I often hear birds, but we don't see them. So I think this is going to be an incredible addition to um, using the sense of, of hearing and having kids begin to get quiet and settled in the, 
in the in the ecosystem and kind of use that other sense that they may be completely avoiding at this point. So I think it's going to be a really nice addition for for my outdoor experiences where kids go out and even journal. Um, I think it's going to be incredible. So I'm I'm so excited. Um, I had an opportunity to spend some time in Costa Rica and there were hummingbirds and we were using, um, you know, like the big cone to capture the sound and then they were creating those soundscapes. So I'm really excited to share that with kids too because I didn't have a, like an in a platform to kind of incorporate it in what we're doing. So I think that's going to be incredible. So uh, thank you for sharing it. That's really good to hear. I'm, I'm glad to hear that it will be useful for that. I, I was also think for, thinking for people that are having their students going out and doing any sort of biodiversity inventory, it would be useful to think about ways of collecting data. Like, you know, if, if you were only collecting data on the birds that you saw, you would be missing some right, or only the ones that you hear, you would be missing others. So just the idea of what does it mean to do an inventory and what are the different ways of, of collecting data? Yeah, Nancy, somebody, and so whoever, whoever put this um, recording the biodiversity piece in here, one of the things was that they don't have zoom lenses. So, you know, like you were saying, Nancy, with not having a fancy camera, so using the, the sound to document instead um, is definitely on the board. Yeah, so double checking. Like if, if Merlin sound ID identifies something and you don't think it's right, the next step is try to find that bird. What does it look like? Um, yeah, use all your senses. All right, great. Does anybody else want to talk about how ideas or even questions for, uh, you know, bounce some ideas off with other folks on the call who are thinking about applications of this technology? I love the, the STEM options. I think that, or really STEAM options, because it gives us a chance to um, challenge students to cross disciplines from um, analyzing songs to analyzing biodiversity. Um, we can, um, and the students, because of this tool, are immediate pros. And for me, that's been a big perk. Like they um, are, are knowledgeable when, they have really started from scratch. So that's pretty exciting. I like the fun factor. That won't surprise you. <laughs> and I, I agree completely. I also was thinking about just the idea of career options. You know, Dr. Van Horn, who developed the models, didn't start out thinking he wanted to work at the Lab of Ornithology. Um, I don't think he even started out with a deep interest in birds. He started out with an interest in engineering and machine learning and kind of fell in love with, with birds along the way. But when you look around the halls of the Lab of Ornithology, there, there are more engineers and database people and computer scientists than there are ornithologists. There are audio engineers. There are all kinds of different technical careers that are really important in science and conservation, um, engineering, all of those kinds of fields. And those, we probably don't do a very good job of letting younger students know what some of those career options are when they're in middle school, high school, thinking about what they wanna be, what they wanna study. Yeah, it's a really good point when we think of um, what the conceptions of a machine learning expert are. I, I'm not sure that um, birding or um, the Merlin app kind of application would would be, um, you know, an intuitive one. So I, I love that idea. <laughs> you know, there's so there's so many conceptions and misconceptions about what engineers do. Um, and when we can apply it to something like this, um, it, it kind of blows open some of those, those perceptions, misconceptions. I love that. All right. What else? Does anybody else want to jump in with what they're thinking? 
or any other questions for Nancy? If you haven't used this app, um, once you use it, it's really hard to stop using it. So it's, you know, and, and it's easy, it's intuitive. It, it's, it just is such a wonderful addition to like, even for, to novice birders, to expert birders. I mean, there's something in this for everybody and especially around education. I just think there's, there are a million and one ways to apply this, this app. Um, in really powerful ways. So I'm just going to go on to the next slide. This um, We're putting together notes that show the URLs from what we've shown here tonight, but um, so you can jump to that right away, but we're going to make an updated list that will include some of the teaching ideas that we've talked about here. Um, and one of the things we haven't really talked about yet is the lessons in professional development with the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. The um, lab has a whole K-12 program. I don't know, is Kelly on right now? Um, Kelly Schaefer? <laughs> Kelly, yes. Do you want to say any words to this group about teaching about birds? Sure, yeah. We have tons of links um, for different age groups on our website resources from just getting you outside exploring and having fun in nature all the way through full science kits. I'll drop a link in the chat window um, to our website. But yeah, I'm so excited to hear somebody else talk about Merlin and hear your perspective, Nancy, because this is just such an amazing tool. And I'm really excited to hear how everybody's planning on using it. Yeah, so thank you. You can put the link in the chat, but it's already in the, the download that people can go to, so it'll be there as well. Awesome. Kelly, do you want to say anything about teachers using things like Birdsong Hero Game or the Merlin app, just from what you've seen? through the teachers you've worked with? Sure, yeah, I would say that the Merlin app, using it with kids is really fantastic because kids are just so intuitive with technology that they pick up Merlin and they know how to use it right away pretty much. Um, so it's also a really cool way I've seen to draw in kids who maybe don't have a super strong interest in nature already, but are think technology is cool. So we will often advocate for grouping kids um, in, in little bird identification teams. So you have a bird spotter, you have somebody recording what they're seeing, and then you have somebody using field guides or the Merlin app. And I anecdotally have seen the Merlin app really draw in somebody who was kind of isolated and not super participating. And then all of a sudden they have the Merlin app in their hand and they're kind of like the hub for everybody for what they're seeing. So it can be a really fun way to draw people or students who aren't like way into the nature thing into it and make it something that is relevant for them and their interests. So um, that's super fun. We do have um, a, a fun blog on our website that's about using Berlin to create your own bird bingo card. So what's great about what Nancy showed you about exploring birds and sorting by likely is you can change the date to whenever you want your unit to be taught. So if you're planning in January and you know you wanna teach birds in April, you can change the date and you'll know what birds to plan for. Um, and so we'll often have uh, kid, or excuse me, teachers plan on their units and then you can pick like the top 10 birds and kids get to make their own bird bingo card and draw the pictures and then kind of go out and get to know nine birds in a fun kind of game way. Great idea, thank you, Kelly. Yeah. All right, so Nancy, it looks like um, just wonderful comments in the chat. I don't see um, any more questions. And so um, just want to tell everybody, you know, we are going to be um, 
we are going to be holding a few more webinars. Oh, Nancy, I like that we lost your slide for some reason. I don't know where it went. Um, we're going to be continuing the webinar series. And so coming up in April, we have um, Dr. Lisa Kensler from Auburn University. She'll be joining us. She is um, has written three books on green schools and green school leadership. And so this is really going to be thinking about um, how we, when we come back from the Amazon, some of the ways that we can think about applying our experience in the Amazon and thinking about all of these things and these kinds of tools to a, a green school model. So we're really excited to have Dr. Kensler with us. And then in May, um, our Dr. Marie Trone will be joining us um, to talk about the pink river dolphins of the Amazon and um, always a wonderful, wonderful speaker and super informative there as well. Um, so I just put the link in the chat there so you can register for those upcoming. And then, you know, we are super grateful for everybody's support. We are a very small, all volunteer run nonprofit. And um, if everybody can spread the word about us, spread the word about our events, um, please send people to our social media and our web page and um, consider we know we have such a generous community and we're always asking for financial support as well to help more educators get to the Amazon with us. So thank you very, very much for your time tonight. We know it is um, a very scarce resource. And so we're, we're grateful that you chose to spend an hour with us. And Nancy, thank you very much for the uh, education about Merlin and for everything that you do. Well, thank you. And I also want to thank Kelly Schaefer for being here and talking to us a bit more about the education programs at the lab. So thanks for joining us. And thank you all. It's really good to see and hear from you in the midst of these crazy times. I know it's not easy to be a teacher these days, but we're here and want to help you in any way we can. So thank you for being the part of the Morpho community. All right. Thanks, everybody. Have a wonderful night. We'll see you soon. Nancy, awesome. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.